You're watching a very special telecast on markets and investing right here on ET Now today. Of course, our special guest is Professor Aswad Damodaran, who is visiting uh, India right now in Chennai. But we have two special gentlemen as well. One, of course, uh, apart from uh, Mr. Aswad Damodaran, who needs no introduction, if you have ever studied finance in any part of the world, it's very unlikely that you've not studied uh, some of their books, like, of course, Damodaran on valuation and uh, among others, 10 books, uh, over 10 books that he's authored. Of course, he's a very uh, renowned professor of finance working out of New York University. And, of course, Mr. Uh, Narain is one of the most famous fund managers here in India, if you, stock, if you follow Indian stock markets. Mr. Contrarian, he's known as uh, uh, widely in the market, and particularly his keen interest towards uh, market cycles and getting to understand when things are not working for a sector, is that a right time to get into the sector? And of course, uh, my friend Chakri Lokapriya here, he's been an emerging market fund manager for almost 20 years. Uh, in his earlier avatar working out of London, New York. And he's been a growth-oriented fund manager. Currently, in his role, he's looking at the Indian markets. Gentlemen, all three of you, uh, it's an honor to have uh, this interaction with you. And Mr. Damodaran, uh, personally so, because uh, almost uh, 15 years back, I was studying your book when I was doing MBA all the way back in Lucknow. So, uh, welcome and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. I'm glad uh, to be here. Sir, I would like to start uh, by understanding your latest thought process, which is uh, narrative versus numbers. Uh, you're obviously giving a detailed presentation on it, but uh, what kind of work have you done on it? How did you arrive on this hypothesis and how important it is for investors to understand the relationship between these two variables? I think the key to understand is how the world has shifted around us. 35 years ago, when I first started doing valuation, getting data was really difficult. You had to write for an annual report. You had to go to a, the SEC to look at filings. And working with the data was really difficult as well. You didn't have spreadsheets. You actually, personal computers were just getting born. So it took a lot more work valuing companies in terms of pulling the numbers together, working in the mechanics. Today, we're surrounded by data. In fact, I think our problem is too much data, not too little data. We're inundated with data, often pulling us in different directions. We have these incredibly powerful models. And in a sense, we've lost control of the process. We've lost control of the process in the sense we no longer value companies. Models value companies for us. And that's a very dangerous place to be. Because I've seen bankers enter numbers into models without any sense of how the numbers work with each other. And the reason I've had to develop stories is to give some discipline to my own number crunching. Because left to my own devices, I'm going to enter numbers into spreadsheets, and those spreadsheets are going to pump out valuations. And I've got to learn to tell a story that ties the numbers together. So it's almost self-taught. I had to do it to slow myself down. Mm -hmm. uh, see, valuations, as we all know, uh, is a process in which you have to assume a lot of stuff, be it growth, be it future profitability, or the way uh, a possible business cycle actually pan out. A lot of uh, promoters weave stories around that hypothesis, and then the narrative actually uh, arrives. Uh, how important it is for a money manager or an investor to take both the variables uh, hand in hand and not lean towards any one of them more than required? I think the key is to listen to other people's stories and try to make them your own. When I buy a company or I invest in a company, I'm not investing in the CEO story. I'm investing in my s story for that company. So I've got to learn to look at a story that a CEO says, listens to, and I've got to do it with respect because that person knows more about their company than they do. But, they, but I also have to recognize that they come in with biases. Biases because they want to make their company look much better than it really is. And I've got to learn to kind of take their story and make it my own. So I, I think it's important to listen, but I think it's much more critical to think for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Dawdurin, uh, you've taught uh, hundreds, thousands of fund managers in these last 25, 30 years. Uh, do you think that a lot of them who have more tilt towards, uh, f uh, you know, f the, the facts, factual data, be it the spreadsheets, uh, that the real, the way story in a company or the rationale for buying a stock or a sector, uh, actually people lose sight on that and, and hence they never get the real grip on the, why there's a compelling case to get into a stock? I think the part, the biggest problem is you start to delude yourself. Once you invest in a company, whether you're long or short, you want your story to be true. 
And as human beings, we have an infinite capacity for self-delusion, which is we, we find facts that back our stories. So I tell people the biggest skill that I see in successful money managers is humility, to the, the acceptance that their story might not be the right one, to be willing to adapt to whatever comes out and say, I am going to make my story fit the facts, not make the facts fit the story. Mm -hmm. Nareen, you've been a practicing fund manager and analyst for, you know, through the cycles, and that's why perhaps uh, you've earned the reputation of a person who has a good grip on business cycles. Uh, do you feel that, uh, how do you feel the, the relationship between narrative for a story, for a stock, versus the numbers when they start showing up? Because if you get into a stock too early, numbers haven't come yet, then you're getting the stock inexpensive. Once the numbers actually start getting in, the cream is already gone. What's your experience as the, in the market, the practical side has been? See, one thing we are lucky in India because what happens is when Professor Ashwa Damodaran does valuation on a stock like Snap, Snapchat, how you do Snapchat valuation is much more complicated than what you do in India. In India, you're dealing very rarely with concept companies. And uh, actually, as fund managers, we are trained to actually think that all these concept companies are mysterious and we can avoid them in India. And most people who avoided them over the last 20 years have benefited except for a brief period between 98 and 2001. So I would say in India, we are lucky we don't have these concept stocks or new tech stocks where, you know, you are forced to make all kinds of assumptions. So the narrative and numbers, I would say, are much easier in India. And uh, when you actually look at look back at years like 1999 or 2007, I believe that actually if you had the right temperament, you could have very easily come to a conclusion that shares were overvalued. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just that we didn't know how long the overvaluation would last. So I would say sitting in India, at least in the last 20 years has been easy. As more and more e-commerce companies get listed, more and more internet companies get listed in India, would we go through the battles of narrative and numbers with professor has been going through? Certainly. So I think I would want them to get listed later because I'm not tuned to actually thinking in this man. Then let's talk about an Indian example to understand this subject better. Uh, the narrative for, say, pharmaceutical sector, till a couple years, years back, Mr. Hamid of Sipla said that India will become the pharmacy of the world. And these are, were very high growth companies, established ones. Uh, and of course, then there was some change in the environment. The U.S. regulator, drug regulator became much more stringent and the narrative completely changed. Valuations of this entire sector almost halved from top. Uh, how, can in, how have you been vigilant uh, in looking for narratives in a sector or a stock at the same time not losing grip on numbers? How have you, uh, if you could share some examples, the, the way you avoided some accidents? So I would say in pharmaceuticals, what happens is that the main area where these changes happened in the narratives was in America. And you're sitting in India. So I would say we got it right to only a certain extent. Because what we did not see in the narrative was that there was a buyer side consolidation. The buyer side consolidation changed the power of a, a seller buyer interaction from the seller to the buyer. And uh, that reduced the margins in pharmaceutical industry for people who are supplying to US. Uh, the second, as you correctly mentioned, uh, FDA issues and other things became big because 30 to 40 percent of most of the tablets made in US were actually manufactured in Indian FDA facilities. So that did uh, increase the kind of vigilance that FDA showed, but that at least was possible to start predicting once you had some setbacks in a few companies, you started thinking, will these setbacks happen in other companies as well? Mm -hmm. So that's been like much more difficult narrative because you're sitting in India and the actual narrative is happening in US. Whereas if you look at something like NPLs in the public sector banks, mm -hmm. there the narrative changed from 2010 to 2018, but being a local issue, 
it was pretty evident that you knew that there were NPLs coming and those NPLs were not getting recognized at one point of time and they got recognized later. So, I would say there it was a local narrative mm -hmm. which we were very vigilant about because we had uh, access to information on the borrowers which were listed and some of them we clearly knew would not be able to pay the debts. Uh, I remember distinctly remember a couple of years back you were one of the early people who got into oil marketing companies. The reason I am talking about this specific example is that at that time people were in complete denial, people were questioning whether deregulation would, would be executed the same way, the way it is being promised. Uh, but that, that narrative actually played out pretty well in numbers and the valuations of these large enterprises also quadrupled. Uh, how did you uh, really got it right where the narrative was there and people were quite uh, circumspect about a PSU, whether it will re-rate or not, but you got it right and the numbers started reflecting in a matter of a year. See, actually if you look at it as oil prices fell between 99 and 2004 also, there was a big rally in some of the oil marketing companies. The interesting thing about the narrative on oil marketing companies has been when oil goes up, they do not deliver returns. So, so far, the government has not imposed any subsidy on oil marketing companies. But the stocks have got derated in the last six months because the narrative is that when oil goes up, there is a risk of subsidy, which is built because it happened in the last cycle from 2004 to 7 by the then government. So, that uh, cycle thinking does happen again because you are still worried that that cycle when oil went up subsidies came is still there in the mind. So, you have a 2004 to 7 narrative playing out in 2018. Is it valid till today? The answer is no. But if there were to be subsidies, then the narrative of uh, rather the narrative of history of 2004 to 8 has played out again. Mm -hmm. Shakri, you have been operating currently last couple of years in India, but have been wearing a hat of an emerging market fund manager for some time now. Does this you know, tug of war you faced in other markets as well. Uh, give us some examples when you were managing money in London and New York. I think nar narratives uh, and numbers uh, do matter across uh, across geographies, across markets. And as Naren was pointing out, there's probably less so in one country versus the other. But again, uh, in, in today's world where data, information, everything moves much more faster than it did before, a business model that happened <laughs> in the US, it would, would take many years for it to be replicated in India if you rewind back, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. But today, that knowledge transfer happens much more faster. And therefore, it sometimes becomes easier where you just look back at the other markets that you invested, made a mistake, where or eventually the narrative went wrong, or the numbers didn't keep up with the narrative, and try to avoid those in the local market that you're operating in. But of course, the nuances of each market become for far more important um, in India sometimes or many a time where some policy decisions are made. And policy decisions are not necessarily in the interest of the businesses. And But you started off with the narrative or thought that it, your business, good product, good service, and therefore will grow over time. Mm -hmm. And that does not pan out as you expect it to be. So, from that perspective, India is still emerging and that's why it's an emerging market uh, in the sense and as we look and copy, adapt and paste to Indian conditions and that's what most entrepreneurs do and whether even if you take pharmaceuticals, you know, it's the big R&D happens with the big pharma in the U.S. Here, they're lastly the uh, largely the generic companies and who just apply and adapt the process patents to an Indian condition and then resell it into the world markets. So, I would think that, you know, the cycle time is getting far shorter and, and therefore it, you need to be more agile in your thought process than you needed to be some years ago. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that uh, being a fund manager or uh, even an individual investor who analyzes the narrative for a sector or stock and then takes bet or sometimes waits patiently for the numbers to start trickling in before building a position. Uh, does it have more relevance for a particular size of a company? Is it more large cap oriented uh, issue or less or, mid, or more mid cap? Or you think it is agnostic of a size of the company? 
That's a good question. To think about it, every large company today was small at some point in time. And now if you, let's take Reliance Industries, one of the largest companies in India. And so long the narrative and the numbers behind the company was its refining business and its ENP business. And today the company is going big in telecom, is make fantastic inroads, is killing the competition, and now is going into e-commerce. It's also one of the biggest retailers. So here you have one of the largest companies in India, which has grown over time with a narrative of all oil analysts. So you had in the past oil analysts covering Reliance Industries. Now today, how will an oil analyst needs to know the telecom industry, he needs to know the retail industry to get a grip on Reliance Industries as a stock. And so it's not just the narrative of oil on Reliance anymore. But you have new narratives which are adding on to the past valuations, or rather which is increasing the valuation if they get it right. And there are also examples when narrative changes, uh, you know, actually come in. By that time the stock is, so I, I'll take it like You must be getting a lot of uh, sell side guys coming in and talking to you about individual stock ideas where there is a promise and there is a case to look at that company or invest in that company but the numbers are not visible right now. But by the time you will actually look at that company or take a, a dip or two in it, the valuation would have completely changed. Would that be inappropriate chasing a story or do you think this is inappropriate taking risk when numbers are not visible? Well, you know, business as, as a country evolves, new businesses evolve. Our new business and social needs, consumer needs create the birth of new businesses with new brand new business models. Indians love going to the movies and love eating popcorn at the movie theaters and they didn't have good facilities. And you had companies like PVR who were born about 10, 15 years ago. Single digit PEs, they were expanding across the country from one multiplex to another. And over time, as that promise became a reality, they started delivering on numbers and expanding throughout the country. From a single digit PE companies today, they're trading at about 35, 40 times. And the earnings are still keeping up. Now it's a different question, how fast can they grow? Will regulations change? So from that perspective, yes, as new needs emerge, or if an entrepreneur is able to identify and then capitalize on it, it can create value. Mm -hmm. Professor Damodaran, how are you analyzing the narrative of global stock market right now? The market capitalization globally is at an all-time high. Of course, uh, companies in the US, mainly FANGs are leading that and making a peop investors across the world jittery about uh, where is it heading. So how are you analyzing the numbers and the story for the, US markets? When you talk about markets, there's always a macro component to the story. And the macro component of the story, to me, the big shift over the last decade is the recognition that interest rates were low, not just because central banks wished them to be so, but because the global economy has changed. The global economy has changed to becoming long-term a lower inflation, lower growth economy, which is going to translate into lower interest rates, which also translates into higher PE ratios for any given level of growth, because your opportunity costs have changed. So I think when people talk about mean reversion in PE ratios, and they look at PE ratios 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they're almost asking markets to do the impossible, is to price stocks as if it was 1986, when T-bonds are at 2018 levels. And it's not just T-bonds, euro bond rates, across the world, if you look at developed market currencies, interest rates are at historic lows and they will stay there. And I think that's a reality we have to recognize now. And that's one of the reasons I'm always cautious about mean reversion, where okay. people invest th expecting things to revert back the way they used to be. And I think, as you pointed out to PBR, you can have a stock where the story for the stock shifts enough that the mean reversion doesn't work anymore. It's not like the stock is getting overvalued. It's a new story driving the stock. And as Naren pointed out, it really depends on where in the life cycle you're looking at companies. I think Indian companies historically have been more mature companies because you didn't go to the market until you were a more mature company. So when you're looking at a more mature company, you're in chapter 33 of a book. You can't rewrite the story. You can't make up new stories. But look at Enola. You're in chapter two of the story. You don't know where the story is going to evolve. So the younger a company, the more critical story becomes. The, the older a company becomes, the more it's been around, the more the story gets established mm -hmm. and the numbers start to matter. Mm -hmm. 
so on that note, I would like to understand from you, because sitting in New York, you have outside view of India. Uh, when you went, perhaps uh, Indian, India's weight in emerging market index, MSCI, EM was say less than 2%, now we are 8.5%. Uh, what stage of the cycle is Indian markets right now versus say developed markets? Are we catching up and how do you see next 3-4 years? I th the way I see the Indian market as I see the big emerging markets, always three steps forward, two steps back. You're never going to have this linear rise where you go from being successful year after In fact, when you see markets do that year after year, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. So it will, there will be, I'm not forecasting anything drastic, but I'm saying there will be disappointments down the road. That's the nature of markets. Markets will overshoot, they'll correct, they will. But I think in the long term, the trend line has to be up, you know, because India's share of the global market is not as large as it should be, given how big it could be as a percentage of the global economy. So I think there's plenty of room to run, but there will be disappointments along the way. Narain, I think the best example to talk right now on this subject, narrative versus numbers, is the way earnings in India have been last three, four years, the earnings cycle. Uh, so one section of the market believes that earnings have been disappointing. But if you take X banks, uh, at least the broader market companies have started showing some improvement in earnings last two, three quarters. We are again sitting here looking at a new quarter ahead. Uh, how you analyze the earnings cycle so far versus the, what the narrative was a couple of years back and versus the numbers which have been delivered so far? See, some of the narratives become very interesting. Suppose oil were to come down and uh, commodity prices come down and inflation comes down. Then at that point of time, what becomes interesting is that earnings come down. Now, inflation comes down, does it help earnings? It doesn't help earnings. In India, inflation came down from 10% to less than 5%. Did it help earnings? It actually reduced earnings. So, do you actually give a higher uh, valuation then to the earnings which come when inflation is much lower and oil is much lower and therefore all your macro indicators are much better? The answer is yes. Did it help the small and mid cap sector? Certainly. So, if you look at the period when oil came down and interest rates came down, I think uh, small and mid caps got re-rated much more significantly. So, I think the market has its own uh, way of looking at things and that's why the market did not obey earnings. And that's why now putting a linear progression and saying now earnings is coming, so market is to go up to the extent that the earnings goes up is again not logical because now you are in a higher oil world, in a higher interest rate world, in a higher current account deficit world for an Indian context. So now earnings may come when the markets can get derated compared to where it was two years back because the macro conditions also play a role. You cautioned investors pretty early as far as the mid cap end of the market. Uh, do you think that reasonable amount of correction has happened there and or you think further scope because the rally actually in mid cap started from 2013 end. Uh, by the time 2018 happened, uh, the data which I was looking at over 50 percent of BSE 500 was at, at least three, four times already. And now we are down, say, 30, 40 times broader markets. So what are your thoughts? See, basically, you know, we, we all want as uh, fund manager cycles to last for uh, six months to one year. So then you can turn bearish, then you can turn bullish, then you can turn bearish, you can turn bullish. The markets need not uh, obey the, to have a short cycles. So, what we do is we look at other indicators. So, if you look at last year, there was a huge inflow into small and mid caps. Now, we have to see whether the froth of inflows into small and mid caps have got reversed. But, uh, you know, I had uh, two examples. One was metals and second was pharma. In metals in 2008, actually, when uh, the metal stocks, actually metal prices peaked, it was in 2015 when they bottomed. And in 2015, it looked like in one year, pharma has corrected, but there was one more year of correction. It's only in the last few months that they have rallied. So somewhere we want market peak to market bottom to be just a short period of time. And time. that need not be. Shakri, you know, uh, right now in India, there is a cult of trying to find multi-bagger stocks. People are uh, value investing word is very actively used almost on most forums. Uh, how do you think, because this uh, interaction will be watched by the target community who is engaged in that kind of activity in the market investing, 
how do you think prudent uh, investors should try to understand the narrative from their point individually as Professor Damodaran said, not from the management side and still not lose sight of numbers so that they can both walk hand in hand? You know, as uh, Professor Damodaran says, and I'm trying to recall back what I learned, which is you start off your valuation with a s simple narrative of how you see your company unfolding over time. And then you keep your assumptions simple and see how it progresses. And you tag on as the company delivers. I do not think that it's possible for you to discover a multi-bagger that, hey, this is going to be the next big multi-bagger. Yahoo didn't see its end coming. They got offers multiple times over and it finally got sold for a pittance. So from that perspective, as management deliver on numbers, and they have the vision and the horizon, they expand their horizons to expand the growth of their companies, your narrative builds on and tags on to your, and the numbers also show up. I think that's the way I would approach, uh, rather than I don't think I have the capability to find <laughs> multi-baggers on day one. Sure. Uh, Professor Damodaran, would you like I, to have I, last I, word I, on that? I agree entirely. I think that the key in investing is to be incremental. If you go for the big win every single time, you're gambling. And that's how people get into trouble. I think, I mean, the notion that you can invest to get rich is the most dangerous notion in investing. You invest to preserve wealth and to grow wealth. You don't invest to get rich. If you get rich, think of it as icing on the cake. You got lucky. But if you go out there and say, I want to make a small amount of money into a large amount of money, you're going to end up with no money at all. So yeah. I think that's, that's the reality investors have to face, is be patient, be incremental, and the multi-baggers will fall in over time. Great, uh, great stuff. Uh, gentlemen, all three of you, it was a very interesting uh, chat we had. And thank you so much for your time and more so for the opportunity to interact today. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.